Good evening, Afton Grove. We're glad to see you here this evening. We're glad you're joining us here on Facebook Live or on YouTube. And you'll be able to be able to go back and pick this up off of our uh, uh, Facebook page and website. But we're glad you're with us, uh, able to come and be with us as we stream these uh, services to you. We ask that you do like us and give us thumbs up on uh, our streaming and on Facebook. That way we know you're there and we'll know you're there throughout the service uh, as you uh, follow us. Uh, if you have any uh, uh, prayer requests or any uh, needs for information or need to contact us in any way, you can text or call the number you see here below on the pulpit. You can call that. You can also get in touch with us through Facebook or through our webpage. Uh, and if you have the pastor's number, you can also call the pastor for those who have that number. Uh, again, please uh, join us this evening with our song service as we uh, uh, sing a few select songs from uh, from some of the older hymn books. Uh, we ask that you join us and uh, enjoy the service. First song we're going to sing is Mansion Over the Hilltop. <clears throat> Two verses, excuse me, two verses of just over the glory land. Oh 
our next song selection this morning, the evening will be Praise and Worship, page 74. Page 74 on Praise and Worship. And we will sing, um, we'll sing all the verses here on this. singing all three verses. Facebook 
and on YouTube and on our webpage. We're glad you could join us. At this time, our pastor will be joining us uh, for the evening service uh, and giving us a uh, think tonight's Matthew, isn't it? We, our service tonight and sermon will be out of Matthew and I uh, ask you to join in with us and uh, be sure and like us and, and uh, check with us on Facebook so we know you're there. Well, good evening. It's certainly, be, it's certainly good to be with you and certainly uh, happy to have you. Uh, I do want to remind you to do a couple things. Um, uh, we are still, this is all brand new to us and, and we're uh, learning on the, on the go as it were. And so uh, there's a number here and it looks like it's a, uh, a landline, but it really is a cell phone. So we would like for you to text us your prayer request and that number uh, in case you cannot see it, if you're on a little tiny phone and you cannot see the number, it's 903-586-2819. If you text us those prayer requests, what we will do is we'll send them Miss Patty. Miss Patty will put them in our bulletin, and we will pray with you uh, for those that you would like for us to pray with. And so uh, also, uh, I know that we're about uh, 10 minutes into our service. If you would like us on Facebook, then we'll know that you're with us and uh, that you're watching and that you're worshiping with us. And at this time, I'd like to turn your attention to the book of Matthew, the chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 15. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And so this is the last uh, of those things. It's the longest sermon that Jesus preaches in the entire New Testament. This is the end of it. And, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful way for him to summarize the Sermon on the Mount because he, he compares and contrasts things that are false with things that are true. And so if you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 7, looking at verse 15, it reads like this. I read to you from the New King James Version, and it sounds like this. Beware of false prophets. Remember, we're talking about things that are false and things that are true. So beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. The men gather from thorn bushes or figs from, from thistles. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. I want you to listen to what Jesus just said. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you'll know them. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of, the, of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? That perhaps is maybe the scariest verse in all scripture. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. And then verse 24 says, uh, or verse 23 says, uh, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Verse 24 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the flood came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Verse 26 says, For everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built this house on the sand. The rain descended, the flood came, the wind blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Then look at verse 28 and 29. This is the very conclusion. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And I'm going to tell you why verse 28 and 29 are in there uh, at, toward the end of the sermon. All right, uh, let's take a moment and bow together and pray and talk to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. We're, we're so thankful, Lord, for you being our God. Uh, Father God, we are, our hearts are burdened right now and and hurt for our world and our nation 
uh, as we're enduring uh, this plague. Uh, as many, many, many others are doing right now, we pray to you, Lord, and we, we call out to you and ask, Father, for you to end this plague, uh, to stop the loss of life. Lord, we know that you are the great physician, and as the great physician, Lord, we know that you have the ability to end this plague immediately. Uh, but Lord, we also know that, that your will is going to be done. And so, Father, we just pray for that. We pray for your will to be done uh, on the earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus taught us to pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to uh, share with you a little thing that I found, and it's uh, by Dr. Andrew Bonner. And he tells how that in the Highlands of Scotland, that the sheep who are pastured there, uh, they're in rocks and crags, and they're they're not on a flat land like uh, I'm, I'm from West Texas, and the land out there is flat. You can see for miles and miles. In fact, when we go to Lubbock, we we go through Post, Texas, and when we come up on the Cap Rock, it's 38 miles from Post to Lubbock. And if you are driving at night, when you when you get up on top of the Cap Rock, you can see. 38 miles from Post to Lubbock, you can see the lights around the loop, uh, those 38 miles. And so it's flat, nothing between Post and Lubbock but dirt. So it's not like that in the Highlands of uh, the Highlands of Scotland. The Highlands of Scotland, there are crags and hills. And so the sheep, uh, the shepherds will pasture the sheep up there. And every once in a while, one of those sheep will find a little patch of, of grass, sweet grass, and it'll be about 10 or 12 feet down, and uh, the sheep will jump down, and he'll eat that grass because it's good. Uh, you know, the Bible says something about forbidden fruit in or many different places, and so uh, it actually says that, that forbidden uh, fruit is sweet, and so those sheep actually have that mindset. They're going down to get that good grass that's down there, but when they finish eating it, and that's down there, and then they get hungry, and they can't jump the 10 or 12 feet back up. And so Dr. Bonner asked one of the shepherds, he said, well, what do you do? Why don't you just go rescue that sheep right away? And he said, if I go to rescue that sheep when he's not hungry, if he's full, he said he will jump out into the air and fall down and die. And he said, because sheep are stupid. And so he said, what I have to do is wait until he's so hungry that he's almost faint. And then I let myself down. I grab the sheep, pull myself and the sheep back up, and he runs through the grass, not into the air. Now, folks, I hate to tell you that, but you know what? Jesus called us his sheep. I hate to, I hate to even think what that means for us. You know, that I hope that we're not stupid. I hope that we're smarter than the sheep. So, uh, we don't want to do foolish things, but this gives us an idea about how our shepherd takes care of us on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, in earlier in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about how we interact with him. For instance, uh, he said that false prophets will not lead you to God. False prophets will not turn the other cheek. They will not uh, give us something that doesn't that, that we should have that belongs to them. They will not give us uh, something that unless it's, unless there's something in it for them. And then they will not go the extra mile. But Jesus will. And so here we are, Jesus going the extra mile, telling us about false prophets. So the first thing I want to talk about is the rise, the fall of the rise, the fall of the false prophet, and the rise of the true fruit. So, if you look at verse fifteen again, it says, "Beware false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing." Now, we've seen this so much, and we've heard it so much that we don't pay attention to what it says because we go, "Oh yeah, yeah, false prophets in sheep's clothing." Okay, have you ever thought about that? False prophets, sheep's clothing actually being ravenous wolves. Now, you know what this is. 
This is a metaphor. Jesus is not saying that a false prophet is actually going to be a, a wolf dressed up like a sheep coming to you. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that there's a man who's going to come to you and he's going to be a false prophet and it's going to sound like the real thing, but it's not going to be the real thing because he's not interested in you. He might be interested in your pocketbook. He might be interested in what you can do for him. He might be interested in how you can raise his social standing. He's not interested in you. He's not interested in the truth. So he is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, Jesus uses actually three metaphors in this text in, in talking about false prophets because he talks about sheep and wolves. He talks about thorn, bush, thorn bushes and thistles. And he talks about good trees and bad trees. Now, every one of these things, are you a tree? No, you're not a tree. Are you a thorn bush? No. Are you a thistle? No. Are you a sheep? No, you're a human being. But Jesus uses these things to compare and contrast things that we don't know with things that we do know. Because we know about sheep. We know about thorn bushes. We know about thistles. We know about wolves. We know about those things. Now, here's what Jesus does say. When you have a wolf, that wolf is a deceiver. And he's not interested in anything good for you. If you have a thorn bush, you're not going to get grapes. Or that, that is, you're not going to get anything good out of that. That's a deceiver. If you have a thistle, you're not going to get figs out of that. That's a deception. It's a deceiver. So you're not going to get anything good out of that. There's a lesson to be learned here. And here's the lesson. Would you chase down a wolf? Seriously. Would you chase down a wolf thinking that that wolf was a sheep and good to eat? No, of course not. What would you do? You'd, you'd stay away from the wolf, right? You wouldn't get around a wolf. A wild wolf, you get around a dog. Some people don't even like dogs. But, but a dog is, is a wolf down through the generations. Now, also, you wouldn't go looking into a thorn bush. You would just wouldn't stick your hand in a thorn bush and be looking for a grape, right? Because you know that there's no grapes in a thorn bush. Where do you find grapes? Of course, you find grapes uh, uh, in, a, in a grapevine. Same thing about thistles. My father loved figs. I'm talking about that dude could go out to a, a fig tree and he'd just stand there and, and he'd grab a fig and brush it off because, you know, figs have that fuzz on like peach. Just brush it off and go, just, I mean, he loved figs. And he'd just eat 10 or 15 of them. I never could get into that. I just never was a fig guy. But now, here's the thing that God is trying to tell us. God gave us sense to know where things are located, i.e., you don't stick your hand in a thistle to get a grape. You don't go into a thorn bush to get a fig. So you look for the truth where the truth is to be found. Now, we, we just a few minutes ago, I was talking about Lubbock, Texas, where I, was, where I was raised. And that used to be the home of the Plains Indians. Plains Indians had a, had a very unique way of hunting. Uh, after they had killed a buffalo, they would dry out the skin and take the head and clean all that out. And then they would make it into a mock buffalo so that they could walk, literally walk into a buffalo herd and then shake off that skin and hair and then kill as many buffalo as they could before the buffalo got the idea, oh, we're, we're being hunted here. And, and listen, I guess buffalo are kind of like sheep, kind of, you know, a little, little bit slow on the uptake. Oh. Oh, I just got shot. Oh, oh, you know, they're dead. But that's the way they did that. Listen, you better believe that in any church of any size, there are false prophets. There are people who are there and they're not there for our benefit. They are there for their benefit. And this is what Jesus is talking about. I don't want you to learn the lesson of the false prophet when you have the arrow sticking out your side. 
He said, I want you to learn the lesson of the, of the, of the false prophet by being a good fruit inspector. Now, here's lesson number one. I have, I have six of these. And they find, you start, find the first one in verse 15, which, where it says that there are false prophets among you. And then in lesson number two is you can know them by their fruits. Now, this, this should be just as easy as it can be, easy as pie, where you know them by their fruits. You, you don't have to ask questions. You just see what they're doing. And if what they're doing is wrong, then get away from them. Don't hang out with them. Don't associate with them. Don't be part of their, of their ministry, so to speak. Uh, number three is good ministers bear good fruit. Look at verse 17. It says, even so good trees bear good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Simple as this. You get around someone, he's cussing, he's drinking, he's doing this, that, and the other thing, then, and he calls himself a minister of the gospel, get away. Don't hang around that guy, or if he's gossiping, or if he's telling bad stories, doing anything. If his fruit is bad, get away. Don't hang out with that person. And then, Here's, here's lesson number four. So I want to do these lessons. Lesson number one, false prophets among you. Lesson number two, know them by their fruits. Lesson number three, good ministers bear good fruit. Lesson number four, it's impossible for good ministers or good Christians to bear bad fruit. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. You hear me? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Now, lesson number five is judgment day is coming. And of all these lessons, this is probably the most important. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment day is coming. Some might say it has already arrived. You can know these characters by their fruit. That's lesson, that's lesson number six. You can know them by their fruit. Verse 20 simply says, therefore by their fruits you will know them. When Jesus is talking about wolves, sheep, thistles, thorns, grapes, and figs, he's not talking about wolves and sheep and thorns and thistles and grapes and figs. He's talking about false prophets and how you can recognize them. That's exactly what he's talking about. Now, the second thing that's in this, that's in this text is the rise of the false professor. I'm not talking about the nutty professor. I'm not talking about the forgetful professor. I'm not talking about the professor at college. We're talking about the person who professes that they know Jesus Christ and they don't. So we're talking about the fall of the false professor and the rise of the true Savior. So look again with me at verse 21, which I told you a while ago, as I, I think is maybe one of the scariest verses of Scripture in all of, in all of the Word of God. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father... So here's one of the reasons why I like preaching through books. You have to find, you have to get a hold of a verse like this. You have to find out what it means and you have to be able to explain it. You can't just go, well, you know, I don't like that. So let me cherry pick something over here. Let me cherry pick something over there and I'll just preach what the people like. Guess what that is? That is heresy. That's heresy. That's what that is. And so God doesn't want ministers of the gospel to cherry pick around what they are going to preach, but to preach the word of God, the whole thing, and let the chips fall where they may. That's what God wants us to do. And so that's what I think we should do. So here is what I think Jesus is saying in this verse. I think what he's saying is casual Christianity is not cool. You can't just say, you know, wear a cross and say, you know, hey, I'm a Christian. Because I wear a cross, or I wear a crucifix, or whatever, or I have a Jesus t-shirt on, so I'm a Christian. You know what? That cross doesn't make you a Christian. That Jesus t-shirt doesn't make you a Christian. 
The only thing that makes you a Christian is Jesus Christ. You must have Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you are not a Christian. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Because he said, look, we're not talking about casual Christians. We're talking about people who, who actually preach the word of God, who cast out demons, who did wonders in the name of the Lord, and they come to the, they come to the judgment seat of Christ. Actually, they come to the great white throne. They come to the great white throne and say, look, why am I here? I should be over there at the other judgment. I should be at the Christian judgment, not at the lost judgment, because I did great things in your name. And you can see that in verse 22. Verse 22 says, many will say to me in that day, what day? The judgment day. That's the day we're talking about. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's have we not preached in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? I think you did, but you didn't. So I want to remind you about something. Our God is, he is very, 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 very faithful to us. And he expects the exact same thing from us. He expects us to be faithful to him. So um, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, you can turn to Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Now, the Acts of the Apostle is kind of a, uh, a fulcrum, if you will, between the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. So the Acts of the Apostles acts like that fulcrum where the rest of the Scripture rests on Peter is doing, second part is what, like what Paul is doing. And so this is kind of the start of where Paul begins to, to get some, some name recognition. And so this is Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 16. And, and I want you to listen to this. To me, this is, this is, I've always thought this was kind of a, where God shows his sense of humor. And it may be, it may be, I'll tell you this, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and preface this by, say, by saying, it may be that your pastor has a warped sense of humor. So I'll just go ahead and tell you, I'll get that out there before we read this. Okay, so it says in Acts chapter, 16, Acts chapter 19, verse 13, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, I want you to listen to what that says. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, exorcists took it upon themselves do you hear that took it upon themselves to call the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches folks that's just nutty it's crazy and so then it goes on because there's a little bit more to the story then verse 14 says then there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. Has anything Christian come in here yet? The only thing that's Christian in here is Jesus Christ. But these guys are not Christian. It says, then also seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, Jewish chief priest, who did so. Then the evil spirit said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And in verse 16, it says, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, and they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Folks, the thing that happens here is these guys were not Christian, but they called on the name of Christ to do something. They called on the name of Christ and on the name of Paul. And the evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? We must be found in Jesus. Must be found in Jesus. So, I've got this in my notes. I just got to say it. These cats don't fit the bill here. They were not saved. Do you hear me? They were not saved. But they were trying to do the works of Christians before they were saved. You cannot do that. You cannot get the cart before the horse. You cannot say, I'm going to work for Jesus. 
without Jesus being my Savior. Doesn't work. Never has, never will. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens here. In verse 23, this is another one of those scary, scary verses. And it says this, Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The one who hung on the cross purchased a place in heaven for you and for me. And when he hung on that cross for those long hours and endured that agony, folks, he paid a price that I should have paid. It should have been me on the cross. It should have been you on the cross. We should have had to pay for our own sins, but we don't because of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the price for us and paid the price to the Father so that we can go to heaven. And when we walk through those gates, we get to hear, welcome home. We don't hear, then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Because he knows us. Because he saves us. Now, Jesus drives home this point once again in verses 24 through 29 where he talks about the fall of the, fa the, false, the fall of the false foundation and the truth of the true foundation. So in verse 24, he says this. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains ascended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, folks, one of my favorite sayings is dumb as a rock. Well, that thing was dumb as a rock. That, that action was dumb as a rock. But you know what? This is not dumb as a rock. This is smart. Because when you build something, you better build it with a good foundation. And there's no better foundation than Jesus Christ. No better foundation than Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. He told Peter, he said, Peter, I'm the rock, the big rock, and you're the little rock on which I'll build my, on which I'll build my church. We must understand that the church is built by Jesus Christ with Christians. We're built on his foundation. And if we're not built on Jesus, we're not built at all. Because what will happen is this. Verse 24 and 25 says that a storm, the storms of life come and assail every person. No person is immune from the storms of life. Everyone gets these. No one's immune. We have storms. And this one says in verse 24 and 25 that when the storm comes, and again, this is another metaphor that Jesus is using. He said, when the storms of life come, they blow against the house. What house? This house, this temple. They blow against this temple, against this house. But the house stands because it's built on the rock that is Christ Jesus our Lord. The storms of life roll over us, but they don't tear our house down. But then we have this, these other two verses, verse 26 and 27, that talk about another house. It says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine that does not do them will be like the foolish man. Remember what we've been talking about all night? We've been talking about wisdom. We have actually foolishness on one side and wisdom on the other side or foolishness and truth. And so here we have it encapsulated in these two verses. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built this house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. We have to understand that Jesus is not talking about a literal house. He's talking about this house, this temple, where he is to reside. If we are Christians, then Jesus resides in us, and we shouldn't fall. 
So everything in this sermon is built on contrast, the false prophet versus the true prophet, the false professor versus the true savior, the false foundation versus the true foundation. Jesus illustrates with metaphors, wolves in sheep's clothing, thorn, thorn bush and thistles, grapes and figs, rocks and sand. Jesus went out of his way for people to understand and look at the result. Remember, I told you that at the end of this sermon that there was going to be something special. And so there, there is. Verse 28 and 29 says this. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Astonished is they were just like their minds were blown. Boom! Minds blown. Why? He said it, right? Because he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribe. Okay, I don't care how good a preacher I might be. I can never be as good a preacher as Jesus. You know why? There's, there's really good reason. Because A, I'm not Jesus. That would be the first and obvious one. And secondly, I did not write this book. And he did. Now, the Lord has blessed me over the years. Uh, it, it's been, you know, I have a, a, a tremendous track record here on this figure thing. The Lord has blessed me with five songs over the last 40 years. And, um, and, and I wrote them. Sometimes I would write the music. Rosemary would write the words. Uh, other times I would write the music and the words. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't care which song it is. I don't care how long it's been since I've sung it or played it. I can go to the piano and I can bang it out. And I can sing the words and not miss, not miss a one. You know why? Because I wrote them. I wrote the songs. The Lord gave me the songs. I wrote them down. The Lord gave me the music. I learned how to play it. They're my songs given to me by the Lord. And so since I wrote them and I know them, I don't forget them. Now there are other songs. I'm working on one right now. I'm trying to learn how to play it and sing it at the same time. And you think that's not hard? It's hard to, to play something and sing it at the same time. For some reason, I, I, I have difficulty getting everything arranged in the, in the right place. But here's the reason why Jesus was, was filled with such authority, because he was the author of the book. You get the author of the book, and he can tell you what it means. You, I don't know if you all know this or not, but if you, if you look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, it starts with the Beatitudes. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. We're going, to, we're going to get to just what happens right after the Beatitudes. Right after the Beatitudes, Jesus begins to go through the Ten Commandments. And he gives those folks a whole new view of the Ten Commandments that they couldn't quite grasp. You know how, you know why Jesus was able to do that? He wrote them. He wrote the Ten Commandments. And as a result of writing, he was able to interpret them. And he could tell them, hey, man, you, you guys have been doing this wrong for 10,000 years. It's not, it wasn't 10,000. It's about more like 3,500 years. You, mean, you guys have been doing this wrong for forever. And he said, I'm here to tell you how to do it right. I just wanna, I want to reiterate three little points real quick. Number one, this sermon is about a false prophet versus a true savior, a, a, versus a true prophet. It's about a false profession versus a true savior. And finally, about a false foundation versus a true foundation. If you want to have all the truths, there's only one way to do it. If you want to walk into heaven, and you want, that his, this is what I want. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. This is what I want. I want to walk into heaven. First person I want to meet is Jesus. I'm not worried about Paul or Peter. I can, I can talk to them anytime. First person I want to meet is Jesus. And then I'd love for Jesus to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Hmm. Man, I'd love to hear that. That's what I want to hear. I don't know if I will or not. 
I know I'm going. I just don't know if he'll say that. I hope he does. If you're not a child of God, there are a few things that you need to do. First of all, you need to understand that you need to get saved. If the coronavirus doesn't do anything for you, it, it needs to drive you toward God. You need to get saved. You need to know that the Lord loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't allow the Lord Jesus Christ to come to the earth and die on the cross. But the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Second thing you need to know is that we are sinful. The Bible says very cl clearly and succinctly that every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. It also says that Jesus Christ is the only provision for our sin. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And every single one of us must make a decision regarding Christ. We have to decide either to come to him or reject him. I'm going to tell you a little secret really quickly. To say, I'm going to wait is the same thing as saying no. I reject you. There are three cases in Acts of Paul witnessing the people who said, done away with you. Not one of them ever showed a sign of getting saved. I want you to get saved. Brother David, how do I do that? You call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you of the Philippian jailer who simply said, Paul, he asked, what do I have to do? And Paul said, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's all you have to do to be saved. No fancy ritual. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to go through a class. You don't have to do anything. But call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and he will save you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your presence, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight to be here in your house, to spend some time with some of your folks, and to spend some time with others who are watching this broadcast. Father God, we pray, Lord, that your word would go out and reap a mighty harvest, that even as we are uh, homebound, uh, we're uh, supposed to be staying in our own place. We pray, Lord, that uh, that you would give us the opportunity to, to reach out with your word and that your word, not, not me, not us, but your word would reap the mighty harvest. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.